Greetings, fellow history enthusiasts. Welcome back to Military X Force. Today, we have an extraordinary and moving tale to share the heroic end of two Navy pilots' inseparable friendship. This heart wrenching story will take us through the bond of two friends turned comrades and their ultimate sacrifice that serves as a testament to courage and camaraderie. If you're as captivated by human stories of heroism as we are, remember to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss any of our compelling narratives. Without further ado, let's dive into history. It's December 4th, 1950, and Lieutenant Thomas J. Hudner is flying his F-4U Corsair above the forests and mountains of North Korea, deep into enemy territory. All is not well. His element leader and friend, Ensign Jesse L. Brown, has been forced to crash his Corsair on a mountainside after taking damage from enemy fire. The weather is bitterly cold, and enemy forces are in the area and almost certainly on their way to capture the downed pilot. Hudnur flies over the stricken plane and is relieved to see Brown push the canopy of the cockpit back and wave the signal he's okay. But even though smoke is coming from under the cowling, Brown does not leave the aircraft. Realizing something is dreadfully amiss, Hudnur makes a dramatic and incredibly brave decision. He too will put his plane down on the mountainside to try and save his friend. Brown grew up in Mississippi in a time of racial segregation. He was born into an impoverished family, but his parents made education a priority, and he graduated from high school. He had a passion for aircraft and flying. To pay for his further education, Jesse waited tables at a bar for U.S. Army soldiers where he was frequently subject to racism. He managed to earn $600 to pay for college and graduated from Ohio State University. Enlisting in the Navy, he earned his pilot wings and was the first African-American aviator in the Navy to pass basic training. Jesse was married to his wife, Daisy. They had a daughter, Pam. Tom Hudner came from a well-to-do family and was due to go to Harvard, but instead he volunteered for the Navy. Despite the two men's very different backgrounds, they became firm friends. In 1950, they were both on the aircraft carrier USS Light as part of Squadron VF-32. They were flying F-4U-4 Corsairs, conducting missions deep into North Korea to support U.S. Marines on the ground. The Corsair was a snarling beast of an aircraft with a reputation of being fun, but hard to handle. It had an 18-cylinder radial engine with over 2,100 horsepower. In his later years, Tom spoke of the events of that day. This audio is of Tom, in his own words telling how he met and became friends with Jesse and the incredible story of how he tried to save his friend back in the winter of 1950. I was scheduled for my first flight, was in the locker room, changing into my flight gear when Jesse came in. I knew that Jesse was in the squadron. I knew who he was, but I knew almost nothing else about him. But he introduced himself to me and I reached out my hand to shake it, and we had a rather brief conversation because I had to get going. But that was the first meeting I had very personable, very, I'd say, reserved and very pleasant. He had a reputation of writing a letter every day to his wife. He was just one of the guys. He was not even an object of curiosity. He took him for who he was, and he was a great guy and a great shipmate to have. He was just one of the fellows in the squadron. The fact that he was black, I think left almost everybody's mind after just a few moments of being with him. He did everything in the squadron that everybody else did, and was a welcome addition to anything he did. There was one time that several of the fellows with Jesse went into a restaurant, and they were turned back at the restaurant because Jesse was with them. I guess there were three or four other fellows, so that small group said they wouldn't go in without Jesse. Jesse sometimes offered to take them into restaurants where the clientele was primarily black or foreign, and they wouldn't let them in because the whites were with them at the time. And this was just a glimpse of what Jesse was going through all his life. On December 4, 1950, the men formed part of an element flying a mission to support U.S. Marines near the Chosen Reservoir. It was a brutal time, most of it caused by the weather and the almost unbelievable arduousness of the flying. When I heard Bill Caney call on the radio, Jesse, you're streaming something. It looks as if you're streaming fuel. Jesse came back after a moment and he said, Yes, I am losing fuel. 
and I don't know how long I'll be able to stay up. So right away the rest of us in the flight looked around to see if there were any possible spots that he could land. There's a fairly large clearing. Not on a level spot, but relatively level. And he headed over for that spot and streaming fuel all the time. While he was concentrating on doing what he had to do in a cockpit, which was losing power, I called to make sure that his shoulder harness was locked and that his canopy was open and locked open because there was procedure at Forest at that time. I always had the cockpit canopy open so that he could aggress the airplane quickly. So when he landed the airplane, a lot of snow came up when he landed. But when he stopped and things settled down, he saw that the canopy had slammed shut from the force of the landing and the fuselage was bent at the cockpit from the force of the crash. Well, all I could see was that he did land. I don't know whether to say successfully or not, but he landed without bursting into flame or anything like that. About half a minute or so before everything settled down with the snow so lengthy, he saw that he had opened the canopy and waved at us to let us know that he was alive. But he sat in the cockpit. He didn't move from what we could see. Then we could see that there was some smoke coming out from under the cowling of the airplane. Then the flight leader came back and told us that a helicopter was on the way there. It would take a while before he could get there. And because of the length of time it had taken to get there and because of the smoke coming from under the cowling, I made the decision to make a crash landing near Jesse and pull him out of the cockpit while awaiting rescue helicopter. And the flight leader, I don't think he knew that I was leaving formation to do that, but I was determined to do it because I was concerned about the fire. The airplane was breaking out in the flame, and Jesse not being able to get out. I dropped my organs. What I wanted to do was get as light as I could from landing in that terrain. So I landed and ended up about 100 yards away from Jesse's airplane. And I was okay. It took about only three or four seconds for the airplane to stop, and my canopy was open, of course. Turns out I hurt my back a little bit, but in the excitement of everything that was happening, it didn't deter me from moving around. I really hit hard, and frankly, it was lucky that I didn't get hurt any more than I was. I was. I got out of my plane and went up to his, and Jesse had seen me coming in. His first words were, Tom, we'd better figure out a way of getting out of here. I could hardly believe how calm he was under the circumstances. He had taken his helmet off, so he's bareheaded. His hands were frozen, and I think what had happened was that he took his gloves off to unbuckle his parachute, and he dropped his gloves so they're down on the floor of the cockpit, and he couldn't reach them. I used to carry a woolen cap pocket of my flying suit, and I pulled that down over Jesse's head and ears, and then I had his scarf, and I wrapped the scarf around his hands, which couldn't have done any good at all, but I'd hoped that that would give him a little bit of help, and I was able to, it was great difficulty, pull myself up onto the wing, and then alongside the cockpit. You could see that the reason he didn't get out of the airplane was because he was caught in between the inside of the cockpit and a control stick that we had that was between our legs, and he just couldn't move. The snows that I said earlier was about two feet deep. Jesse and I talked a little bit. There wasn't much conversation that went on. He said to me, Tom, if anything happens to me, tell Daisy how much I love her. Eventually, the rescue helicopter got there, but despite their best efforts, Jesse could not be freed, and he was succumbing to the bitter cold. Even getting to the cockpit was very difficult with the airplane on a slope and with the deep snow. They considered more extreme measures to get Jesse out of the plane. But with the conditions they had, it was virtually impossible. Deep in enemy territory, in the mountains, with night falling and with the prospect of capture, they were forced to make the difficult decision on what to do next. Tom spoke to the helicopter pilot. He just said, I'm not equipped for flying at night in the mountainous terrain. He said, I've got to go. And he said, you can stay here, but I've got to get my airplane out of here. And it was so obvious that there's nothing we could do for Jesse at that time. By the time we left him, he had expired. For his extreme bravery, Tom was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Truman. Jesse's wife, Daisy, was present at the ceremony to represent Jesse. And so Tom was on that day able to keep his promise and deliver the last words of his friend. Some months later, Daisy experienced an incident that happened while walking home. She gave an interview recounting the story in detail. 
She was walking home from class going back to her apartment, and as she got in the complex, she looked down at her car and stopped. She asked her friend, Look at my car and tell me what you see. Her friend replied, That's Jesse, sitting in your car. Both women agreed that they could see Jesse in his green uniform, sitting in his Dodge Wayfarer. When they got up close to the car, he was gone. Daisy was certain that she had been visited by the spirit of Jesse and said, wherever he was, he was watching over Pam and me. And there you have it, the incredible story of the heroic end of two Navy pilots' inseparable friendship. It's a testament to the unbreakable bonds forged in the crucible of adversity and the remarkable courage that resides within us all. If you were as moved by this story as we were, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and become a part of our community dedicated to uncovering the remarkable tales of history. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, the stories of the past have the power to shape our present and inspire our future. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.